Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk once again about Activision Blizzard, one of our favorite companies to discuss here in Virtual Legality. We won't be talking about their pending acquisition by Microsoft much or the union issues that they are facing, which we'll probably discuss in a future video. No, instead today we're going to talk about what brought the company to the Virtual Legality Party in the first place. That, of course, being that last summer of 2021, we saw a lawsuit from the state of California for, among other things, sexual harassment and gender-based pay disparity. Now, since then, a whole host of things have happened, which we've covered at length in our Activision Under Fire playlist. But among those is that gaming journalists and journalists outside of gaming have put a spotlight so bright on the company that everyone is looking at everything that they do and have done with a level of granular detail that honestly seems a bit much for any corporation to survive. And in some cases, those stories have gone, in my opinion, a little bit too far. And one of those things happened the past three days. Now, before we get into the specifics there, I do want to point out that this is a Patreon-supported channel. We're going to have other ways to support the channel very, very soon, which I'm excited to share with you. But for right now, Patreon is the main way to support the channel. And as one of the tiers in our Patreon, you can support a specific episode, which Nord here, who I'm giving my special thanks to, has done for many, many, many months. We cannot do it without viewers and listeners like you. So many thanks to Nord and the other patrons and other folks that support the channel. So, so many thank yous. Now, on with the show. As I mentioned, a few days ago, Axios put out an article entitled, Embattled Activision Says It Is Facing Increased Attrition. This was done by Stephen Totillo, who we've discussed in this space from time to time. I think he does a good job, but very often he's reading very closely on typically filed documents with the SEC and other business documents that maybe get too close a read a little bit. Here, we have a similar situation where they're reading through the risk factors and forward-looking statements, disclaimers that are put forth in the filings that Activision Blizzard has made. They're dragging out various aspects of those documents. And the main headline there was about the fact that Activision had tweaked some of its risk factors to indicate that they were having a little trouble keeping people on board and potentially hiring people because of everything that happened in 2021. Not a ton there, but still pretty interesting. And I certainly don't begrudge Axios reporting on that. However, what actually got picked up in a number of outlets, which I found to be a little bit more problematic, is this last section of the article, which is called One Startling Acknowledgement. The company says California law required it to add another woman to its board of directors by the end of 2021, but it failed to do so. Now that's accurate. However, it got reported on with increasing levels of vitriol and commentary in a fashion that I thought was actually a little bit unfair to Activision, given the aspects of this law that I was familiar with when it was passed in 2018. And a couple of these, you can see Eurogamer, Activision blames Microsoft acquisition for failure to hire another woman to its board as required under California law. And then Games Industry Biz going a little bit further even than that, Activision Blizzard failed to meet requirement for women board members. Publisher had more than three years to meet three woman minimum on board of directors. And that's accurate. That's true. But also implies a certain amount of fault with Activision that maybe isn't. Now, what did Activision Blizzard actually say for itself? Well, first they said, as of December 31st, 2021, 20% of the members of our board of directors are women and 20% are members of underrepresented communities. Under current California law, we were required to add an additional female director to our board of directors by the end of 2021. To meet this requirement and improve the diversity of our board of directors, the company retained a search firm and began interviewing potential additional female directors in 2021. However, since the company's current directors would cease to continue to serve on our board upon consummation of our proposed transaction with Microsoft, we were unable to conclude the process in 2021. We will be continuing our efforts to appoint a new female director. And with that, as the only explanation that we've gotten so far from Activision on this, you got the subheadings about them blaming the Microsoft transaction for this. And certainly the Microsoft transaction is referenced here. It is one of the things that they complain about but there's a whole number of other things going on with Activision Blizzard, not the least of which is if they try to hire a third member to their board as a woman specifically for being a woman in 2021, well, let's just say the company had a whole lot of other things going on. And it wouldn't surprise me that even attempts to hire a woman to the board of directors in the period after the state of California files its lawsuit 
were met pretty derisively and maybe with some hung up phone calls and the like. Because you don't want to be in a position to be some kind of token or to be some kind of symbol for a company that is going through the press junkets and issues with messaging that they were in 2021 when they're going through those things. And if Microsoft comes in and they come in late in the day in November and December, you then would have to say, I'm going to take on all these negative optics, potentially all these problems, the fiduciary duties that we discussed here in virtual legality. And I'm only going to get to do it for a short period of time before Microsoft wipes us all out anyway, it becomes even more unattractive. Now, part of the complaints that I've seen leveled at Activision and social media and in these articles is that, hey, you had three years to do it. And that is true, but there's a reason there's a ramp up in the law. And there's a reason to believe that we'll get to in this video that Activision Blizzard wasn't actually just saying, ah, screw it, we're not going to comply with the California law and waiting till the end of 2021 to even try, but instead was going through a process of getting up to that three woman number over the course of time that California actually ascribed before they hit a brick wall, something of their own creation in the summer of 2021. And really there was no saving it from there. But it's also part of the story that this law is very unusual. If you aren't familiar with the United States, the state of California is often very aggressive with its legislation, very aggressive with its rights and powers against various entities within its boundaries, as well as in this case, against the other states. And there are reasons to actually look at this law and say, well, you've got unconstitutionality issues potentially, you've got various other problems within the ambit of the law, and it wouldn't surprise me if some corporations were taking a slow roll approach to actually complying with a law that on its face seems to have those issues. And as we will see, those issues are acknowledged by the state itself, culminating in some testimony given in a court case that we're going to discuss as part of this video, indicating that the state doesn't have any intention of actually enforcing the law as written. So with all that as background, I think it's important to look at those things to understand how Activision, or if we're not interested in Activision for purposes of the conversation, other corporations are constantly evaluating what compliance and non-compliance looks like for these various laws, especially for a jurisdiction like the state of California, which is maybe more aggressive than most with how it chooses to enforce these things. So let's look at the law in question before we can talk about what issues it may or may not have. So this law says no later than the close of the 2019 calendar year, that's December 31st, 2019 to, to you and I, a publicly held domestic or foreign corporation whose principal executive offices, according to the corporation's SEC 10K form, are located in California, shall have a minimum of one female director on its board. A corporation may increase the number of directors on its board to comply with this section. Now, there's a whole number of things that already jump out of this statute. The first of which is the description of who this applies to. So we see that it applies to a publicly held domestic or foreign corporation whose principal executive offices are located in California. Now, why is that interesting? Well, we have to go back to what a foreign corporation is. And to do that, we have to explain what a corporation is at all. You may have heard me describe a corporation here in virtual legality in other contexts as a legal fiction. And what that means is that it is completely a creature of a law. Here in the United States, a state law that gives it life. That each state in the United States has various laws about corporations, LLCs, partnerships, other business entities that you might form and how you can form those, what information you have to give, how you are to operate, various other aspects of what it means to be a corporation. And in so doing, each law is different and we, say, hey, if you're going to form a corporation, you have to choose which laws you want to apply to you, where you want to be domiciled. And very many of those corporations choose Delaware for reasons that are effectively an accident of history. But suffice it to say, Delaware law is preferred by public corporations and institutionally invested in companies here in the United States. But it doesn't mean that you have to operate in Delaware. In fact, most of these companies don't operate in Delaware. They are domiciled in Delaware. Delaware law gives the corporation its form and function, and then they operate with people in headquarters and manufacturing entities and what have you in different states, at which point they tell those states that they're going to operate in them. And then they apply for what can be variously named a certificate of authority, a certificate to conduct business, whatever it might be, to tell that state, yes, we're operating here. We're willing to pay unemployment taxes or franchise taxes, whatever else you have to engage with in the company. But when that happens, those states are not governing the internal operations of the company. 
how the officers are, are elected, how the board is elected, how the shareholders work, what bylaws have to say, what the name can be. Those are all from the state of domicile. And when you're operating in one of those other companies, they call a company that is domiciled elsewhere a foreign corporation. We aren't talking about needing to be Canadian or Mexican or Italian or anything like that. We're talking about a corporation that is domiciled, that is incorporated, that is created in a state outside of California. Now, as I just mentioned, generally speaking, the state where you're operating doesn't have control over what we call your internal affairs. And almost every state in the union respects that with some important exceptions, including the one that we're looking at here today. The state of California says it doesn't matter where you're domiciled. If you have your headquarters here in California, then we're going to enforce this specific rule about your board, how it operates, who your shareholders have to elect. Remember, boards don't just come out of the ether. They're elected by their shareholders. And we're going to control that even though the ordinary doctrinal approach to all of this would require Delaware law to make those kinds of assertions. And I will tell you right now, if you were to try to enforce this specific provision at the Delaware Court of Chancery, go and tell Delaware that they have to enforce this, chances are it's not gonna work out terribly well for you. The Delaware would say, no, no, that has to do with the internal affairs operating a Delaware corporation. We control that, not the state of California. So that jumps out. The second piece that jumps out here is that they say a corporation may increase the number of directors on its board to comply with the section. Now, as we will see in how California has elected to defend this statute, one of the reasons why this sentence exists is so that they can try to say that this isn't a quota, even though they're using a number. They shall have a minimum of one female on the board. B, section B here says no later than the close of the 2021 calendar year, what we're talking about here. The same company if its number of directors is six or more, shall have a minimum of three female directors. And they say, well, you can increase the number of directors on the board so that a man doesn't need to lose his seat. And that means that it's not a quota. But I do think that that argument has some weaknesses in and of itself. Now, you also see this law make specific concessions for smaller boards. If the number of directors is five, the corporation shall have a minimum of two female directors. And if it's four or fewer, it will have a minimum of one. So as the board gets smaller, they are reducing the number of women required, but only to a certain point, which will also come up when we talk about quotas and power and rules and why I think there might be an issue here. That's the overall law. But as so many of you ask when I talk about laws here in this space, one of the big questions is what happens if I violate it? And they say the Secretary of State may adopt regulations to implement this section and the Secretary of State may impose fines for violation of the section as follows. For failure to timely file board member information with the Secretary of State pursuant to a regulation adopted, the amount of $100,000. For the first violation, the amount of $100,000. And then for a second or subsequent violation, the amount of $300,000. So not huge amounts of money when we talk about these giant billion dollar corporations, but not small amounts of money either. And each director seat required by the section to be held by a female, which is not held by a female during at least a portion of the calendar year, shall count as a violation. So when we're talking about how Activision missed this particular deadline, had they got a woman hired to fill a seat on the board of directors by December 31st, 2021, they would have been in total compliance with what the state of California was asking for. But as they admit to their shareholders, they didn't do that. But these mays are, as it turns out, from the state's defense of their statute, pretty important. And we'll see why in just a minute. As you can imagine here in the United States, Anything that looks like a quota based on a protected characteristic like sex or gender is going to be looked at askance by a number of folks that are trying to have equal protection of the laws as required by the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and is incorporated amongst the states uh, in a similar fashion. And that isn't any different with what we saw with this law as it was passed in 2018. I've pulled up a summary article uh, called California Mandates Quotas for Board Gender Diversity. Will it fuel a a movement? And you will see this reference to quotas made by most people describing the law. You've got a certain number of people that are mandated to be put into a certain number of roles at your company. Most people are going to look at that as a quota, which presents its own problem. We'll talk about in just a minute. It's worth noting that the state of California itself was aware that this might not pass muster. In signing the bill, Governor Brown issued a letter acknowledging that there have been numerous objections to the bill and serious legal concerns have been raised. I don't minimize the potential flaws that indeed may prove fatal to its ultimate implementation. 
Nevertheless, recent events in Washington, D.C. and beyond make it crystal clear that many are not getting the message. Given all the special privileges that corporations have enjoyed for so long, it's high time corporate boards include the people who constitute more than half the persons in America. Now, I'm going to get deep into the weeds on political philosophy and certain aspects of this that you may or may not wind up agreeing or disagreeing with. Please leave a comment to this video talking to me about what you like or didn't like about what I'm going to discuss here. But it's important to note that there are legal parameters here and there are philosophical parameters here. You can 100% agree with the notion of representation being important and the state should do something about it. And if this gets that done, then there is a certain value to it one way or the other, while still acknowledging that, at least as we presently understand it, the federal laws and the state laws, including their constitutions, are designed in part to limit what the government can actually achieve. And the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which provides for equal protection under the law, does provide certain limits that are unfortunately due to Supreme Court jurisprudence here in the United States, a little bit muddy in the middle. The reason that they will be trying to avoid the word quota is that the Supreme Court has often said that quotas are bad, that there is potentially a value for state governments and federal governments and the entities underneath them, including universities and graduate student programs, etc., to value diversity. And if they can value diversity, then they can do certain things to try to realize that diversity so long as they avoid crossing certain bright lines. And for the most part, that means that you can advantage uh, certain sexes or genders or various other protected classes as long as you don't make that some kind of mandatory quota system. Uh, and here, the state of California is going to be arguing against that this is a quota and I think to somewhat limited effect, which the governor acknowledges here. Now, I have a problem with that from a legal perspective because I always hate this argument that basically says leave it to the judiciary. Here, the legislature has passed a law with full acknowledgement that this might be a problem. Here, the governor has signed a law with full acknowledgement in the letter acknowledging that this might be a problem and essentially leaving it up to the judiciary to stop them if they can and unfortunately, the judicial process of actually going through and declaring a statute unconstitutional takes time. And during that entire period where it takes time, you've got companies operating with a certain amount of chilling effect. Hey, do we need to comply with this? Do we not need to comply with this? And in addition to that, there's also a PR effect here in California that I think they're leveraging quite well, especially if you agree with the aim that they have, but that says, hey, are you actually going to sue us over this? You are going to look like the worst people on earth if you sue us to try to get rid of this, which is why the other aspect of what we will see in respect of this particular law is that the most likely plaintiffs, the corporations that are being forced to do this, aren't actually appearing to challenge the law. They're letting other groups do that for them, I would argue primarily because they don't want the bad optics, which of course Activision Blizzard doesn't need to worry about so much because it's just piling on on them at this point in time. But I hate this argument and I think it's a little bit disingenuous for an executive branch officer like the governor or the legislative branch like the Senate and House in California to actually go forward and say something like, well, we'll pass it and maybe the court will stop us, but this is too important uh, to let go for mere unconstitutionality problems. Now, you do see some of these summarized here in this article as well. It says potential legal challenges. Over two dozen organizations officially oppose the bill, stating in a coalition letter that it prioritizes a single element of diversity and violates the U.S. Constitution. One legal challenge may well come under new section 2115.5. As a matter that smacks of internal corporate governance, the new legislation naturally raises the issue of whether it could legitimately be applied or enforced against companies incorporated outside of California. As this article says, you may recall that generally the internal affairs doctrine provides the law of the state of incorporation governs those matters that pertain to the relationships among or between the corporation and its officers, directors, and shareholders, that it exists only under Delaware law. Delaware law controls those kinds of situations. And that's a function of state comedy and a function of our constitutional order, which is why you also see reference to the fact that they might well have a problem here. The law adds the new section, which purports to make the new mandate expressly applicable to foreign corporations with outstanding shares listed on a major U.S. stock exchange to the exclusion of the law of the jurisdiction in which the foreign corporation is incorporated. And as they say, there's not a smidgen of equivocation about the constitutionality of the law in this article from Stanford's Rock Center for Corporate Governance, in which Professor Joseph Grunfist argues that while well-intentioned, 
This legislation will not achieve its intended effect because it is unconstitutional as applied to the vast majority, if not all, of publicly held corporations headquartered in California, remembering for purposes of our conversation that Activision is domiciled in Delaware and operating in California. The Internal Affairs Doctrine will limit the law's application to only 72 corporations headquartered and chartered in California, or 1.59% of all publicly traded corporations. California's own legislative analysis concludes that the use of a quota-like system as proposed by this bill may be difficult to defend. The legislation thus offers a poor bargain for diversity advocates, gain a trivial number of board seats, if any, but increase the risk of judicial rulings inimical to broader affirmative actions initiatives. Instead, the professor advocates shareholder activism as a more effective, less perilous route to achieving board gender diversity. Now, that's just one professor's opinion, and certainly you can have reasonable minds differ on this. In fact, the actual evidence here suggests that the California corporations have actually moved on this based on these mandates, regardless of the challenges we're going to read a little bit more about. You've got 766 uh, women filling board seats of these various companies in 2018, and then 1,400 or so in 2021, doubling over the course of the period of this law. Although I believe the state also says that more than 563 seats uh, would also need to be filled for full compliance in 2021, which we know at least one of which uh, was not filled, being the, the one at the Activision Blizzard boardroom. So this particular analysis maybe gets the specifics wrong, although we don't know if it is held unconstitutional, whether that will all be rolled back. Certainly, the long arm statute effect of California's law trying to apply to companies that aren't domiciled within it, combined with the kind of facial, intuitive discriminatory approach of having a gender-based quota, leads one to look at the law a little bit askance, which is exactly what we see happen throughout this period where the law is in effect. Here's another article, another complaint filed against California board diversity statutes. This is as of November 24th of last year. And you see basically that this statute is from the shareholders, that the plaintiff asserts that its injury arises out of the law's impact on the behavior of shareholders who elect directors to the board. The diversity statutes, this particular group claims, therefore impose a race, sex, and sexual orientation-based quota directly on shareholders and seek to force shareholders to perpetuate race, sex, and sexual orientation-based discrimination. That's almost a First Amendment kind of complaint, right? When we think about the way that corporations are actually governed, as we've said in virtual legality, the shareholders get to control who the board is. They are the owners of the company. They get certain rights under Delaware law in this particular case to say how the corporation should be governed. And here California has interjected itself to try to change how that will happen. And here the group says, hey, you're also forcing us to effectively discriminate on this basis in a way that many shareholders might be uncomfortable with. It further contends that the diversity quotas injure plaintiff's right to vote for the candidate of its choice, free of a government-imposed race, sex, and sexual orientation quota, and that under the 14th Amendment, which again requires equal protection under the law here in the United States, that this particular statute facially discriminates on the basis of race, sex, and sexual orientation and serves no important nor compelling government interest. And race is brought in there because there's a second law in California that talks about underrepresented communities that have to appear in the boardroom of these California corporations. Now, this lawsuit was just recently brought up, so it's going to be a while before we hear more about it. However, in 2019, we saw a challenge that we can actually talk about more at length. And as this particular article summarizes it, the first legal challenge, Crest versus Alex Padilla, was a complaint filed in 2019 in California state court by three California taxpayers seeking to prevent implementation and enforcement of California's board gender diversity statute. Framed as a taxpayer suit, the litigation seeks to enjoin Alex Padilla, the then California Secretary of State, now U.S. Senator, from expending taxpayer funds and taxpayer financed resources to enforce or implement the law, alleging that the law's mandate is an unconstitutional gender-based quota and violates the California Constitution. Now, we're going to be talking about this particular legal challenge because there's a great article summarizing some of the evidence that was presented, and we can put ourselves in the shoes of Activision Blizzard or another company's board as they observe all of this happening in the background. But what's important to note is that that law gives 2019, 2020, and 2021. This challenge is filed shortly after the law goes into effect, and I don't have a judgment to share with you because it hasn't been made yet. So even knowing that this challenge was filed very early on in the overall timeframe given under the statute, 
there wasn't actually a full on judicial action taken one way or the other on the statute while it was pending for these corporations to take a look at. And that's a problem, right? That's a problem just in the practice of law in general. It isn't really very fair. If this law were more obviously unconstitutional, if it was just straight up obvious to everyone that ever looked at it that it was unconstitutional, it would still probably take a certain amount of time to run the course of the judicial review process in order to find that. And in that time period, the corporations or entities or persons, however this law was aimed, would still probably have to abide by it or fear the wrath of the state in question, which is its own kind of problem. And it's the kind of problem that I referenced when looking at the governor's letter. Now, this challenge was filed in 2019. It actually starts its opening statements as reported on by Reuters here in December of 2021. So the challenge is filed in 2019. It takes until December. It's supposed to be a court case that lasts about a week. And if we look at the summaries of this thing, March 2nd, 2022, we get the conclusion of that case and we still don't have a judgment on it. Uh, so we're going to look at this summary because I find it to be fascinating. But before we do, I want to talk about Activision just one last time before we kind of get into the weeds of what this California law is, because I want to talk about what I was mentioning at the top of this video, which is that kind of certain notion of unfairness with the way the company is being treated. Now, I think they've earned a lot of the bad messaging and a lot of the bad reporting on, on how they operate. I think that's fine. But when you get to a place like Games Industry Biz and they comment on it taking more than three years to find three women directors, it's not just about whether the law is constitutional. It's not just about whether it's being actually addressed by other lawsuits that you're waiting to see come to fruition if you're running one of these corporations. It's also about the fact that, yes, they had three years. Yes, there's a reason the state gives you three years because they know it's going to take a while to actually get responsible people of high qualifications in these roles. That would matter no matter what sex or gender they have. And you don't want to just scuttle giant public corporations and hurt their value somehow. So you give them the time to actually comply. Combined with the fact that for all intents and purposes, it looks like Activision was actually trying to comply with this law, right? If we go and we look at the summary that they give us of the board of directors, we see a company engaging in a somewhat slow, but certainly consistent process to add women to their board of directors. We have a reference to Ravita Bowers here. Ms. Bowers has been a director of Activision Blizzard since January of 2018, the very same year that this law would go into effect, saying effectively that you have to have one woman on your board of directors. They complied with it even before it became law. So they're covered in the 2018, 2019 period. Then we scroll down a little bit more and we see, okay, we started from zero. We've added one. Now we've added Don Ostroff. When? In June of 2020, they were doing one effectively in the 18, 19 period and the 2020 period. And then they were going to hit the 2021 period, except of course, that the company had the troubles, right? So as I mentioned earlier in this video, it's entirely understandable why Activision Blizzard, at least as of July of last year, would have a great deal of difficulty finding a woman willing to be on their board of directors uh, going forward from there. Uh, and that is, again, of course, a problem of their own making, particularly with respect to the messaging after this all went down. But it's also a program problem that I think people can understand. And I think it's a little bit unfair to characterize it this way when you have three years for a reason and they've been adding women board members at a good clip. So you might disagree with that. Again, you can leave a comment to this video. Obviously, a lot of people feel very strongly about Activision Blizzard. And originally, I thought their response might effectively be bupkiss, that they were just saying, hey, we're not going to comply with that California law for some of the reasons we'll see in this court case that I'm about to summarize. But that doesn't appear to be the case. Much like these other businesses that appear to just be complying with the law regardless, at least until some court cases come down, probably because of the fear they would have in actually challenging these various things, Activision was in the process of complying. And yeah, you can also hold their feet to the fire a little bit that they only talk about the Microsoft deal when that's pretty late in the day to actually blame. But the reasoning given for why they didn't comply with the California law is actually a little bit immaterial. And anybody looking at these things doesn't need to be told by Activision Blizzard that, hey, we got into a lot of trouble on the basis of sex and gender in the second half of 2021. So if we didn't have someone in place by then, yeah, it was hard to recover at that point in time. So that's the thrust of why I think Activision Blizzard is cast down a little bit. But now we're going to talk about some of the really interesting things uh, that came out of this particular trial case. Now we have to give some disclaimers. This is a summary of other summaries 
for the most part. That's put together by J.D. Supra and some articles by Cooley. Uh, but I think it's still useful for analyzing what actually happened in this case. Why did it run so long? What were some of the arguments that were brought? And why do some of the arguments mean that, frankly, these corporations probably shouldn't have been listening to California, at least if they felt like they had to do something because of the threat of fines? Uh, and so let's go talk about that. Again, this is the taxpayer lawsuit. This is effectively taxpayers in the state of California that say, don't spend our money on this thing that is facially discriminatory. You don't necessarily have to agree with that, but that's the argument that they're bringing. And we see this summarized as a bench trial beginning in December in Los Angeles County Superior Court. It was supposed to last six or seven days. But you know, one thing and another, closing arguments were just completed and the case has now been submitted. As we await the court's decision, let's talk about what happened here. In the complaint, the plaintiffs contend that the law's requirement for female representation on corporate boards employs express gender classifications. As a result, the law is immediately suspect and presumptively invalid under the equal protection provisions of the California Constitution and subject to, quote unquote, strict scrutiny in the California courts, requiring the state to have a compelling governmental interest and the classifications to be narrowly constructed to serve that interest, according to the plaintiffs. And that's right. You hear about the equal protection law uh, and Unfortunately, the judiciary has invented a whole host of things around the notion of the government, whether federal or state, providing equal protection to its citizenry. One of those things is that it's okay for the government to discriminate if, broadly speaking, the government has a compelling reason to do so, and they aim how they're going to discriminate very narrowly to accomplish whatever reason they give for actually affecting that discrimination. Here, the plaintiffs say, well, look, you don't have a compelling interest in how boards are managed, how the corporations operate, especially based on the long arm statutes we've already discussed. But also, even if you did, this is hitting the problem with a sledgehammer when a scalpel is what the Constitution requires. You can't just mandate these things uh, without going forward with a more specific, narrowly tailored solution. And again, as we talked about, the Supreme Court has mostly come out in a similar vein, saying quotas are bad and the values of representation and diversity may be compelling in certain instances for government and government facing actors. Uh, and here we've got private actors, of course, with corporations publicly traded, but that the state of California might have that interest. It is still the highest level of scrutiny that a court will use. And usually finding yourself in the strict scrutiny bucket means that the court will strike down your law. So it goes without saying that this was always going to be a tricky hill for California to climb when it looks to all the world like a quota, right? Even Axios, while reporting on its efficacy, talks about it as the boardroom quota law. This isn't unusual. It's exactly what you would expect to describe this law. It's telling you you have to have three women on your board. That's a quota of women for the operation of your board. Ah, but California says, no, Rick, it's not a quota. It did not set a quota, said the deputy attorney general who's defending the state of California in this. No man has to lose his seat. That's because instead of creating quotas, she said, the law allows companies to add seats to make room for women while not requiring any men to lose seats. And that's a useful argument. However, it doesn't actually work, in my opinion. So if we look at how a board of directors actually operates, it's important to note that for the most part, a board of significant size is going to operate on the way that we operate our democracies. It's going to be operating on a vote basis. It's going to be majority. It's going to be based on some majority of certain sub-segments of that board of directors. And what happens when you mandate the addition of more board seats is that every other board member loses proportionately the value of their vote. This is most obvious if we look at the bottom line number, right? If we do the thought experiment, if a number of directors is four or fewer, the corporation shall have a minimum of one female director. So you're a man, you start your company, you don't want other members of the board, you are a single board member, your board of directors is the size of one. State of California comes in and says, you have to have a female director. So you add a seat, you add a female director to that second seat. And now I think the self-evident problem is, as it turns out, self-evident right? That single member of the board of directors is now a member out of one out of two and can't make any governing decisions without actually agreeing with the second board member. So that might not be a problem. You might be fine with that for the purposes of diversity and representation, but it's important to note that something of real value was lost by the single board member. And that same problem is 
the same across all sizes of boards. It's just a difference in dilution. So when we talk about Activision and they're more than six members of the board, if they are at six and we pretend they are at six and now they're six of nine, that is different levels of power that they otherwise have that was changed by the state of California operating and on the basis of a specific number to hit, three, two, or one in the case of subsection B here. So that looks to the world and to me, if we're being 100% honest, like a quota, regardless of the fact that that first one person board member didn't lose his seat, he still lost the ability to control the governance of his corporation. And that's really what we're talking about here. So it doesn't solve the problem of what is or isn't a quota, but we see it referenced in many places in this summary, many of which I'm not even going to go over with you as the main reason why the court should allow this because it's not really a quota. I don't think that's a winning argument from the state of California. Continuing, and this is perhaps the most interesting couple of paragraphs in the article, in my opinion, remembering that the taxpayers have brought this suit to defend the tax monies of the state of California. We don't want to spend our money on this. The state of California apparently defended itself by saying, no, we're, we're not, we're not spending money on this. Really? According to the AP, the deputy AG also contended that the state made almost no expenditures to implement the statute. And the second day of trial heard testimony from a division chief testifying on behalf of California's secretary of state in support of that point. Now that's bad enough as it is. This continues. The AP reported that she testified that the law was essentially toothless and that there were no plans to penalize companies for not complying. That's because the law is not enforced. It's required, but there's no penalty. So it's essentially voluntary, she said. And there was no follow-up if they failed to file the required report. And many companies did fail to file the required report. Although there were no current plans to adopt regulations that would provide for fines, she could not say that the state would never impose fines. So a lot of things are happening here. One of which is that in open court, the state of California is saying it's essentially voluntary. Why? Because they're taking the version of this law that says you may impose fines and saying we're not going to, which is nice and potentially useful for someone that doesn't want to comply with this particular aspect of the law, either as a conscientious objector on unconstitutionality grounds or because uh, they're lascivious misogynists and don't want women on their board. Either direction you go, if the state of California isn't enforcing fines, then That's valuable information said in open court, but also it's of little comfort to someone that's challenging the law because effectively, if they retain this section, as this testimony said, you say, well, we're not using it now, but we have the right to use it in the future. That's what the law says. So the court can't just look at a situation like this and say, well, I guess if you're not using it, it's fine. They still have the capacity of using it. And that in and of itself is the cudgel that could potentially be a problem. But this continues even further. The AP also reported about a letter entered into evidence from then Secretary of State Alex Padilla, one of the named parties here, to then Governor Brown two weeks before the bill was signed. And this is good evidence if you can submit it to a court. In the letter, Padilla warned the governor that his office couldn't enforce the law as it was written. While he supported the admirable objectives of the law, he said his office didn't have the capacity or authority to collect fines. Any attempt by the Secretary of State to collect or enforce the fine would likely exceed its authority, Padilla wrote. Padilla said it would cost more than $10 million to create infrastructure for the program and fines anticipated would be inadequate to fund the estimated $900,000 it would cost each year to maintain it. Now, let's be honest. I have no idea why a system designed to essentially contact your California corporations and check the number of females on their board would cost $10 million to operate, $900,000 a year. But I don't claim to be the structural operator of a government bureaucracy in the state of California. So maybe that's a legitimate cost. Either way, these combined, one, have the defendant of this particular case saying, I don't think this is enforceable. And two, have the current secretary of state saying, we're not enforcing it anyway in order to get out of damages, in order to say, hey, the taxpayers don't have a case because we're not spending any money on it. Combined you've got what amounts to a kind of illusory law that is designed for symbolic purposes, regardless of its constitutionality, with a letter from the governor saying, I'm not sure it's actually enforceable anyway. So just with that context, you've got massive, massive problems with actually enforcing this law. And it's massive, massive problems that corporations that are dealing with this kind of thing would be well aware of. So at bare minimum, Activision reports this to its shareholders. Yeah, it gets reported on because Activision is persona non grata right now. But overall, 
it's a speeding ticket and it's a speeding ticket where the cops are essentially forgiving everybody that they even deign to pull over. So if you are a fiduciary of your investor's assets, if you think there are problems with the law in and of itself, you know, perhaps you shouldn't be complying with it in any event. So it becomes a kind of catch-22 and a problematic snare for the legal offices and the board of directors of these corporations that are domiciled in a different state and operating in the state of California while they're putting forth testimony like this. And that's the environment that Activision Blizzard found itself in. You don't have to like any of this. You don't have to like the way California is operating. You don't have to like the fact that they aren't putting enough teeth behind this law that they've put forth or the exact opposite to understand that a corporation looking at all of this information would be well within its rights to say, I don't, I don't know if we have to comply with that at all. Then the state of California has some testimony that is trying to back up their position. A few days later, a University of Michigan, go blue, professor of business administration and business law, Cindy Schiapani, was on the stand for two days testifying as a corporate governance expert. Among other things, she said, women are grossly underrepresented on boards of California companies. In addition, she testified about a number of studies and reports that concluded that gender diversity could improve profitability and that companies that fail to fully utilize this labor talent will limit their own growth and opportunities for economic gain. And this is not a problem that will fix itself. Now, here I have to admit, coming from my background as an economist, coming from my background here in virtual legality, where we spend lots of time talking about companies that take every inch of margin and even cross the line sometimes to get every last dollar out of the consumers that they provide products or services to, I do find a philosophical issue with this last set of statements, right? Let's assume that she's right that having more diversity increases profitability, that companies that fail to fully utilize the labor talent of the pool of women available to be on the board will limit their growth, then to me, knowing corporations as I do, actually establishing that for them is a problem that solves itself. If they believe that profitability is out there, if they believe that growth is out there, that's the kind of thing that corporations generally take you up on because as I've said before, they don't believe anything. The corporations itself generally not having any specific stance on any of the nonprofit initiatives that you would like or any of the various isms that could otherwise apply to the individuals that make up their board or officership. So corporations want to make money and want to make money for their shareholders, want to make money for their officers and internal folks that have shareholdings in that company. We've seen that writ large. And yet you've got a statement like this. This is California's primary argument that if they were more diverse, they'd be more profitable. And I guess from the state of California's perspective, they would get taxed more and the state of California would make more money, which is their compelling interest. Usually it doesn't work that way, but I think that's the logic that California is using here. But ultimately you have to come up with the understanding that says if the profitability is right out there, these corporations aren't doing it due to their latent misogyny or sexism or maybe more express misogyny or sexism and that we can't overcome that without a mandate from the government that may or may not be constitutional under the rules that we have today. So this particular line of argument, I find a little bit wanting, but certainly reasonable minds can differ on this kind of stuff. She continues, says something that I think raised the judge's ire a little bit here, at least as described in this summary. Why is having board gender diversity useful? Shiapani testified about research demonstrating that board gender diversity can avoid harmful groupthink as women can bring expertise in compliance, ethics, and social responsibility, as well as being typically more familiar with consumers. Shiapani answered that research shows women do bring different perspectives and care about certain issues in a different way. The judge repeated her question asking if she was saying that women are different from men, and Shiapani said studies show women can bring different skills to the table. The judge then asked, so men wouldn't have those skills? And Shiapani responded, oftentimes those skills get missed. And you see an exchange like this, and you shouldn't overweight these kinds of things, especially as a summary of a summary. But you do start to see some of the problems inherent with what the state of California has done here, right? We generally don't like discrimination. We don't like misogyny. We don't like sexism. We don't like all the isms. But we also don't like the government enforcing variations of discrimination in order to, according to California, combat discrimination, to provide diversity because women aren't being put on the board for reasons that are not appropriate, according to the state of California. The judge here is really probing at that particular question with this particular witness effectively saying that women are just different and that men can't actually meet the needs of a corporation uh, without women, which sounds a lot like a variation of sexism, which can very much get you in trouble when you're looking at things from an equal opportunity, equal protection 
perspective. And that's what the judge appears to be probing here. I don't know which direction the judge is actually going to go, but that's what you see. You also have a sidebar here talking about the fact that the studies basically go both ways. Although some studies have shown a negative effect, such as a 2010 study in Norway that found a decrease in stock price, many show a correlation between board gender diversity and better firm performance. And then they continue on talking about that from the perspective of the witness. Now, under cross-examination, this particular witness also rejected the contention that the law had a discriminatory effect against men. Boards lacking women can simply expand the number of seats to come into compliance with the law. So no, the law does not require men to lose seats. Again, I find that to be legally non-responsive to the question of whether it is discriminatory. I don't think there's actually a question there uh, when you base a proposition on the sex or gender of the individuals that have to be hired for that particular role. And certainly the men not losing their seat is, is good to try to mitigate against that interpretation, but it doesn't eliminate it, uh, as we talked about with especially small boards. Uh, but at any board level, you're going to have changes in the ability to govern the company, regardless of whether or not the individuals that were there before the hire get to keep their seat. She also discussed the inadequacies of other softer approaches such as term limits or the Rooney Rule, which would require that a woman be included in a candidate pool for every open board seat. These alternatives to a mandate, she said, were unlikely to produce meaningful results. And this also kind of hints at what we were talking about with respect to the governor's letter, which is in the ignoring of whether or not the government actually has the capacity and right to do the things that it's putting forth to do, right? You can agree from a philosophical perspective, and you don't have to agree with this proposition, but you can, that this is overall a good thing and that the state of California should be able to enforce it however they like because they're doing a good thing. However, the U.S. Constitution, the California Constitution, various other aspects of our governmental structure prevent the governments of our country from doing certain things. And the 14th Amendment comes in to say you can't discriminate without a compelling interest. You have to do it narrowly tailored, and you have to afford the equal protection of the law to everyone, regardless of whether or not you think that ties your hands too much, right? The overall thrust of this argument is, well, we tried other stuff, right? We tried things like the Rooney Rule, which would say you have to interview a woman for your bo open board position. You have to do these various other things. We tried soft power and that wasn't working. So we're going to mandate the thing, even though our specific secretary says, yeah, it looks like a mandate. Yeah, we reserve the right to find people, but we're not going to use that because it would be too expensive to. And here this candidate says, Effectively, we need to have the right to do this because it's a good thing and it doesn't matter what the Constitution says or anything else because the other ways won't work. And that's a very utilitarian approach to the problem, but it's not a very legal one. And I think that's where California might well get caught up in these kinds of arguments. The court also heard from Hannah Beth Jackson, who served as a California state senator from 2012 through 2020 and authored the law. She contended that prior non-mandatory attempts to achieve board gender diversity were just not effective. It's the same argument we saw re right here at the end of the earlier witness's testimony. Jackson made several appearances on the stand over a number of weeks. Under cross-examination, plaintiff's counsel questioned her about discussions in some of the studies on which she had relied, indicated that while there was a correlation between board gender diversity and profitability, no causal link was ever established. And an article in The Economist even rejected the contention that more board gender diversity could increase profits. Jackson said she did not pay much attention to the article because it focused on European companies and experts she spoke with did not have faith in its methods. I was not going to compare apples to oranges. It was irrelevant, misleading, and inappropriate, Jackson said. When asked why she didn't examine the studies in the article, she responded that no studies were mentioned. So you have here the senator that put forth the law essentially being complained about by the plaintiffs as only reading the studies that she liked and not the studies that she didn't. And that's really what this summary finishes off with. Plaintiff's counsel continuing to suggest that Jackson ignored studies or news articles that did not support her contentions and her cross-examination turned confrontational. And there's a little bit more anecdotal evidence of her fighting with either the other side or the judge uh, as well. And I don't know that that's terribly useful to the legal issues here, but certainly suggests a court fight that was rather contentious between the state of California and these plaintiffs and that a decision could be released any day with this summary being five days ago. I wanted to go through that process because we don't do a lot of deep dives into laws and their constitutionality and the specifics about why these things might or might not work. And I really wanted to have this conversation in the context of Activision Blizzard, because I think if we're being reasonable, we can look at a company and say, that is a whole bunch of messes that the state of California has put forth. They have acknowledgments that they're not going to enforce the fines. They have acknowledgments that the law might be unconstitutional on its face or have other legal problems. They're trying to enforce it against the internal affairs of a company that isn't even domiciled or organized 
under their own statutes and that there are a whole host of problems here. And so we're going to take a slow roll approach to compliance. And, and I wanted to do that, even though I'm not sure Activision was actually doing that. I'm not sure Activision was actually slow rolling as much as they got caught up in a maelstrom in the middle of the year. And much of the time that would have been spent on a search firm and potentially positioning that third board member just didn't happen uh, because what woman would have worked for Activision Blizzard after the middle of 2021? I don't know. I think it's unlikely that they'll even find anybody to sit in that seat. But certainly this court case in and of itself suggests the state isn't coming after them anytime soon. So from a fiduciary perspective, you have to ask, why would you even bother? Now, obviously, there's a lot of philosophical questions. There's a lot of government questions, a lot of the role of government questions in the summaries that I gave forth here. Leave me a comment. Comment to this video about how you think I'm right or wrong on the various things that I have looked at here. Not only is that useful for engagement and helping YouTube see the channel, it's useful for having growing conversations between people that hopefully can have a reasonable disagreement or agreement and learn from each other and the different perspectives that are put forth therein. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. As Nord has, as previously referenced, thank you, Nord. Otherwise, just subscribing, ringing the bell, sharing us on Reddit, other forums, everywhere that you might think our information and videos are welcome or useful, please do so because every little bit counts and every section that we can move up this little subscriber count makes YouTube see the channel more, share the channel more, and it's a snowball effect and it goes faster and faster as it has been doing throughout the history of the channel. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.